Chapter 10 Little's Explanation It was the fifth day since Chagnar Fawn had been sent back through time. Algernon and Little sat in the latter's laboratory and discussed the destruction of the horror over cups of black coffee. You think, then, that the last manifestation we saw was a kind of spectral emanation without physical substance? Not wholly, perhaps, replied Little. An odor of putrefaction came from it. I should regard the phenomenon as a kind of tenuous reassembling, rather than an apparition in a strict sense. Chognar had been incarnate for so long in the hideous shape with which we are familiar, that its disembodied intelligence could reclothe itself in a kind of porous mimesis, before it returned to its hyperdimensional sphere. So rapidly did our machine reverse entropy, that perhaps tiny fragments of its terrestrial body survived, and these, by a tremendous exercise of will, it may have reassembled, and, figuratively, blown up. That is to say, it may have taken these tiny fragments, and so increased their porosity beyond the normal porosity of matter, that they produced the cyclopean apparition we saw. All matter, you know, is tremendously porous, and if I could remove all the vacuums from your body, you would shrink to the size of a pinhead. Algernon nodded, and was silent for a moment. Then he stood up, laid his coffee cup on the window sill, and crossed to where Little was sitting. We agreed, he said, that we wouldn't discuss Chognor further until, well, until we were in a calmer frame of mind than we were a few days ago. It was a wise decision, I think. But I'm now so certain that what we both witnessed was not an illusion, that I must insist you return an honest answer to two questions. I shall not expect a comprehensive and wholly satisfying explanation, for I'm aware that you are not completely sure yourself as to the exact nature of Chognar, but you have at least formed a hypothesis, which there are a good many things you haven't told me which I've earned the right to know. What do you wish to know? Little's voice was constrained, reluctant. What destroyed the horror in the Pyrenees? Why were there no more massacres after, after that night? Little smiled wanly. Have you forgotten the pools of black slime, which were found on the melting snow, a thousand feet above the village, three days after we sent Chognar back? You mean... Little nodded. Chognar's kin, undoubtedly. They accompanied Chognar back, but left, like their master, a few remainders. Little round pools of putrescent slime, a superfluity of rottenness that somehow resisted the entropy-reversing action of the machine. You mean that the machine sent entropy-reversing emanations half across the world? Little shook his head. I mean simply that Chognar Fawn and its hideous brethren were joined together hyperdimensionally, and that we destroyed them simultaneously. It is an axiom of virtually every speculative philosophy based on the newer physics and the concepts of non-Euclidean mathematics that we can't perceive real relations of objects in the external world that since our senses permit us to view them merely three-dimensionally, we can't perceive the hyperdimensional links which unite them. If we could see the same objects, men, trees, chairs, houses, on a fourth-dimensional plane, for instance, we'd notice connections that are now wholly unsuspected by us. Your chair, to pick an example at random, may actually be joined to the window ledge behind you, or to the Woolworth building. Or you and I may be but infinitesimally tiny fragments of some gigantic monster occupying vast segments of space-time. You may be a mere excrescence on the monster's back, and I 
a hair of its head. I speak metaphorically, of course, since in higher dimensions of space-time there can be nothing but analogies to objects on the terrestrial globe, or you and I, and all men, and everything in the world, every particle of matter, may be but a single fragment of this larger entity. If anything should happen to the entity, you and I would both suffer." but as the monster would be invisible to us. No one, no one equipped with normal human organs of awareness, would suspect that we were suffering because we were parts of it. To a three-dimensional observer, we should appear to be suffering from different causes, and our invisible hyperdimensional solidarity would remain wholly unsuspected. If two people were thus hyperdimensionally joined, like Siamese twins, and one of them were destroyed by a machine similar to the one we used against Chognar Fawn, the other would suffer effacement at the same instant, though he were on the opposite side of the world. Algernon looked puzzled. But why should the link be invisible? Assuming that Chognarfon and the Pyrenean horrors were hyperdimensionally joined together, either because they were parts of one great monster, or merely because they were one in the hyperdimensional sphere, why should this hyperdimensional connecting link be invisible to us? Well, perhaps an analogy will make it clearer. If you were a two instead of a three-dimensional entity, and if... When you regard objects about you, chairs, houses, animals, you saw only their length and breadth, you wouldn't be able to form any intelligible conception of their relations to other objects in the dimension you couldn't apprehend, the dimension of thickness. Only a portion of an ordinary three-dimensional object would be visible to you, and you could only make a mystical guess as to how it would look with another dimension added to it. In that, to you, unperceivable dimension of thickness, it might join itself to a thousand other objects, and you'd never suspect that such a connection existed. You might perceive hundreds of flat surfaces about you, all disconnected, and you would never imagine that they formed one object in the third dimension. You would live in a two-dimensional world, and when three-dimensional objects intruded into that world, you would be unaware of their true objective conformation, or relatively unaware, for your perceptions would be perfectly valid so long as you remained two-dimensional. Our perceptions of three-dimensional world are only valid for that world. To a fourth-dimensional or fifth or sixth-dimensional entity, our conceptions of objects external to us would seem utterly ludicrous. And we know that such entities exist. Chognar Fawn was such an entity. And because of its hyperdimensional nature, it was joined to the horror on the hills in a way we weren't able to perceive. We can perceive connections when they have length, breadth, and thickness, but when a new dimension is added, they pass out of our ken, precisely as a solid object passes out of the ken of an observer in a dimension lower than ours. Have I clarified your perplexities? Algernon nodded. I think so. Yes, I am sure that you have. But I should like to ask you another question. Do you believe that Chognar Fawn is a transcendent world soul, endowed with a supernatural incorporeality, or just, just a material entity? I mean, was Ullman's priest right, and was Chognar an incarnation of the oneness of the Gramic mysteries, the portentous all-in-all -all of theosophists and occultists, or merely a product of physical evolution on a plane incomprehensible to us? Little took a long sip of coffee, and very deliberately lowered his head, as though he were marshalling his convictions for a debate. I believe I once told you, he said at last, that I didn't believe Chognar Fawn could be destroyed by any agent less transcendental than that which we used against it. 
It certainly wasn't protoplasmic or mineral, and no mechanical device not based on relativist concepts could have affected the dissolution we witnessed. An infrared ray machine, for instance, or a cyclotron, would have been powerless to send it back. Yet, despite the transcendental nature of even its carnate shell, despite the fact that even in its earth shape, it was fashioned of a substance unknown on the earth, and that we can form no conception of its shape in the multidimensional sphere it now inhabits, it is my opinion that it is inherently, like ourselves, a circumscribed entity, the spawn of remote worlds and unholy dimensions, but a creature and not the creator, a creature obeying inexorable laws and occupying a definite niche in the cosmos. In a way we can never understand, it had acquired the ability to roam, and could incarnate itself in dimensions lower than its own, but I do not believe it possessed the attributes of a deity. It was neither beneficent nor evil, but simply amorally virulent, a vampire-like life form from beyond the universe of stars, strayed by chance into our little walled-in three-dimensional world. One unguarded gate may be standing ajar. But do you believe that it actually made a race of men to serve it, that the Miri Nigri were fashioned from the flesh of primitive amphibians? Little frowned. I don't know. Conditions on the cooling earth two billion years ago, may once have been such that creations of that nature antedated the process of biological evolution with which we are familiar, and we may be sure that Chognar Fawn, with its inscrutable endowments, could have fashioned them even from the plankton-like swarms of small organisms which must have drifted with the tides through ancient oceans. Little lowered his voice and looked steadily at Algernon. Some day, he murmured, Chognor may return. We sent it back through time, but in five thousand or a hundred thousand years it may return to ravage. Its return will be presaged in dreams, for when its brethren stirred restlessly on the Spanish hills, both I and Si Ho were disturbed in our sleep by harbingers from beyond. Telepathically, Chognar spoke to sleeping minds, and if it returns, it will speak again, for man is not isolated among the sentient beings of earth, but is linked to all that moves in hyperdimensional continuity.'